When 41 years ago, NBC admirably tried to turn the writings of James Thurber into a sitcom starring the great William Wyndham, the tenth story they chose as the basis for an episode was A Friend of the Earth. There is something existential about the battle of wits Thurber describes. He appears in the story as himself of The New Yorker. His nemesis is Zeph Legan, the corn pone handyman of Ludlow, Connecticut. Zeph's shtick is to tell a new acquaintance, lost my wife ten years ago, then as sympathy is exuded, punch it out with, yep, lost her in a dry goods store, I slipped out the back door. Thurber hates his guts, but in their battle of wits, Thurber is losing. And he had no hesitation in admitting this in Thurber country in 1949. The conclusion of A Friend of the Earth by James Thurber. Zeph fixed the studio floor about two weeks later. I heard him sawing and nailing with long intervals of silence in between, but I didn't go out to the studio to see how he was getting along. I confess there was more to this than my instantaneous annoyance at the sight of the man. I was afraid of his tongue. He had thrown me over his shoulder, easily and in public. He was in the studio most of the afternoon, and if I had hoped that he would go away without dropping in on me, I was doomed, as the saying goes, to disappointment. Zeph never knocked on anybody's door. He just opened it and came in. He found me in the living room. Job's done, he said. So soon, I snapped. He pulled the flashlight out of his pocket, walked over to my chair, and handed it to me. Thanks, I said unamiably. Send me a bill for the carpentry. Got it right here, said Zeph, and he handed me a slip of paper. I glanced at it, and it seemed reasonable enough. Then I clicked the flashlight. It didn't work. It doesn't work, I told him. He twinkled and grinned. Needs new batteries, he said. Should have known better. I should have said nothing. But once again, I walked into his little trap. You said you would take it to Barton's and have it fixed, I told him. His eyes crinkled. Nope, he said. Told you I was going by. Didn't say nothing about stopping in. That was too much for me. I brought the flashlight down with great force on the edge of a table and smashed it to bits. Then I turned slowly to Zeph Legan, my eyebrows up in feigned astonishment. Defective, I said coldly. Zeph took his harmonica out of his pocket and rubbed it with the palm of his hand. He had lost the twinkle in the grin. It was a moment rare, perhaps unique, in the life of the great philosopher. Zeph Legan couldn't think of anything to say. He walked out of the room playing Nellie Gray, and that was the last time we ever spoke to each other. I got a man named Larkin from Danbury whenever anything around the house needed fixing. I think it was in September that the Ludlow Men's Forum decided to ask Zeph Legan to be the principal speaker at their monthly meeting. I saw the announcement in the Ludlow Journal. It said that Ephraim Legan, Ludlow's most beloved citizen, had consented to address his neighbors and to share with them his rich and salty wisdom and his profound knowledge of life. The title of his talk, the journal said, was A Friend of the Earth. The forum meetings were held in the small chapel across the street from the Congregational Church. There were about 40 of us present when, after the reading of the minutes of the previous meeting and the reports of various chairmen of committees, the smiling Paul Morton stood up to introduce the speaker of the evening. It was an introduction dripping with marmalade and ornamented with flowers, and everybody loved it, and everybody laughed and applauded as Zeph got slowly to his feet. I had seen him only once or twice in passing since the incident of the shattered flashlight. I had felt ashamed about that show of temper, and I hadn't even told my wife that I had broken the lamp deliberately. Zeph let his eyes roam about the room, and they fell upon me at last in a chair near the wall in a row at the back. Neighbors, began Zeph, I ain't always been like you good folks is nice enough to think me, a man of philosophy and easygoing nature. It was a thing happened when I was a young fellow that set me on the right path, you might say. My father gave me a flashlight for Christmas one year, and the batteries wore out, like they's bound to do if a man aims to see more in his life than the good Lord wants him to. So I gave the flashlight to an uncle of mine, because he said he'd get it fixed for me. Well, he didn't exactly say he'd get it fixed for me. I'm a going by Burke's store, he says, where they has batteries. You want me to take it along? So I says that would be very kind of him, but he brung it back that evening and it wouldn't work when I clicked it. Needs new batteries, says my uncle. And when I told him he promised to have it fixed, he says, never said nothing about having it fixed. Said I was going by Burke's store. Didn't say I was stopping in. Well, sir, like many a man young or old that ain't growed up, and some of them never does, I lost my temper. 
I seen red and I smashed that there flashlight into a thousand pieces. I realized in a second this wasn't no way to act to a man of greater age and more common sense than me, so I turned it off with a joke. I turns to my uncle and I says, solemn like, defective, I says. Then I got up quietly and quickly from my chair and started to slip out of the chapel. A number of the men turned and stared at me, and several frowned and said, shh. Bill Logan plucked me by the sleeve as I passed his chair. Are you walking out on Zeph? He whispered. I leaned down close to his ear. Yes, I whispered, forever. I had intended to spend the winter in Ludlow, but business took me back to the city. Or at least I told Paul Morton and the others that business took me back to the city. My wife knew better, of course. She knew that Zeph Legan was behind my determination to get out of Ludlow and stay out. Several months went by before I got up enough courage to tell her about the flashlight and Zeph Legan's opening remarks on the night of the forum meeting. To my surprise and delight, I discovered that I was able to laugh with her about what she called my straight-set defeat at the hands of the philosopher of Ludlow. She has promised, however, never to tell the Mortons about it, or Bill and Lucy Logan. I don't think I could stand that. A Friend of the Earth by James Thurber. That's December 3rd, 31 days since Republicans took control of the House. Mr. Boehner, where are the jobs? I'm Keith Olbermann, good night and good luck. And now a perfect segue for Mr. Thurber of Ohio State University to a discussion of what the Dems and Script Ohio have in common. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Rachel Maddow. Good evening, Rachel. Keith, that was an incredibly kind segue given that you know what's about to happen and you know we need all the help we can get. <laughs> Good luck out there. Thank you very much, my friend. Hats off to you, as it were. <laughs> he knows. He's foreshadowing.